trust that uh, you're all doing well and yeah that's good to know even the online students and uh, good to have all of you on the call today let's pray and begin we we'll continue learning about believers authority i want to request uh, anybody either online or here in the class to please begin with a word of prayer Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this new life. Let's pray, Father, giving us. Thank you for the greatest compassion for us. Lord, I submit to your hands. Each every one, Lord, in this world, each every classes. Lord, I submit to your hands. We will know this wisdom. We will understand the power of the conscience. When we pass this on to Father, Lord, you talk with us through your word, through your faculties. We are talking with us, the teaching of Father. Lord, I bless you in your name. I bless you in your deeds. And I ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And thank you, Savita. Uh, let's get back into our notes. And I want to give some time to ask questions. I think we just wrapped up the lesson and probably you know didn't have enough time to ask questions. So last time we saw how Satan is completely defeated and uh, we are victorious because of the cross. We have complete mastery over the evil one. We have complete protection. And um, we also said that you know there are some, some uh, schools of thought that say that each time Satan will bring a case against us in heaven. And then, you know, that has to be fought. But those kind of things are not true because Jesus has already paid the price in full and so we stand justified uh, in our position in christ so those things we have seen and uh, there are no more legal rights satan does not have any legal right in the life of a believer so we are completely like we fully belong to jesus and satan cannot interfere in our lives that is what we have understood and then we also said that sometimes believers are worried about backlash backlash means if something is done, the enemy will attack you back. So we don't have to worry about that also because Jesus said that nothing by any means shall harm you. Okay? And the evil one cannot touch you. It's only when we open doors. For example, Job, he said, whatever I feared has come upon me. He was fearing it, that this, will, this might happen, this might happen. And it actually happened. Because when we fear, it's the opposite of faith. It has the effect like faith, but in the opposite direction. Okay, so fear is like that, and we have to get rid of um, uh, unhealthy, ungodly fear from our lives. Is fear healthy? Is fear good or bad? <coughs> bad. Okay. What about uh, some of our online students? What do you think? Is fear? Okay. Good if it is uh, in the right things. Okay, so we understand that emotions are kind of neutral. It's not good or bad. See, sometimes fear is good. When we are crossing the road, do we need some fear? We need. If we don't have any fear, we just cross the road. That shows that uh, we are lacking the ability of discernment. Okay, so fear in itself is not bad. Sometimes we need fear. If you have an exam, we have a presentation, we have something to do, we feel scared like, oh, I have to do well, I have to study better. If we don't get that feeling, then something is wrong. Okay? So fear in itself is a good thing. All emotions that way are neutral. It depends on the situation. But if I have unhealthy fear, where I feel God will not help me, something evil will happen, every time this happens, I don't know why this and that, it's not aligned to the word of God. That is ungodly. That is unhealthy. Isn't it? So that's how it, it uh, works. Fear in general, it's not a bad emotion. No emotion is bad or good. Even anger, it's, it's not like anger is bad. Sometimes we have to get angry because those things, if you remember Jesus, when they, the money changers came to the temple and they're trying to do business there, it's a place of worship. It's the place to host the presence of God. He got so upset. 
you know, we read Jesus turned the tables. Like you can imagine, Jesus is getting very angry. He turned the tables, made a rope, uh, rope to whip uh, those guys. So Jesus got angry. You know, God gets angry with the wicked, the Bible says. So anger is a good emotion when we use the right emotion at the right time. But when it is used in the wrong time, in the wrong way, then any emotion can become a bad one. Similarly, fear. So unhealthy fear or ungodly fear is an open door for the enemy. We are not saying don't fear at all. We can fear the Lord. We can fear, you know, things that are challenging for us. It's a good thing. It will help us to become better. Okay. So in this way, um, uh, I don't know why I'm teaching about emotions. I'm supposed to teach about believers' authority. Okay, fine. So anyway, so no backlashes, but it happens because of uh, open doors. And we should not allow open doors of any sort. Then we also saw about no more higher levels, higher devils. What is that scripture passage we looked at and said that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places? Ephesians, correct. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 6. So now that we are in that place of authority, we can be bold. Because... No devil is higher than the heavens. Only God is in the highest place, which is in the heavens. And the Bible tells us our positional authority is from that place of heaven. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So we don't have to worry, especially when we take responsibility. Maybe in ministry, our responsibility is increasing. And uh, the Ordinary way of thinking is, the more closer you draw to God, the more difficulties will come. Satan will attack you. Satan will, you know, do this. He will do that. But don't have to worry. Let him do whatever he wants. We already know that Jesus has taken complete mastery over the devil. So we don't have to be afraid. Okay. So this is what we touched upon. Uh, any questions, thoughts before we move on to the next Yeah, I, I think you might need to use the mic. We've uh, discussed in depth about no Satan being defeated, as in being yeah. crushed, expelled, yes. condemned, disarmed, and destroyed. Yes. But having said that, uh, we know the ultimate uh, thing that's actually happened, or which will eventually happen. So when we are in our Christian walk of faith, in our yeah. journey, yes. why is it that you know we as believers at times backslide? Mm. And how is it that you actually overcome backsliding? Mm. Mm. Okay. We know that uh, Satan is defeated, but why does the believer still backslide, you're asking? How do you overcome it? So uh, when we study the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews was written to a bunch of believers who were going through... Um, uh, a very rough journey. Reason being, once the Hebrew believers or the Jewish believer, Jewish uh, people who were following Judaism, they accepted Christ. They faced a lot of persecution. See, in the in that society, they had a lot of rights and uh, like property rights, and um, you know, uh, accepted more in high positions of authority. So they had many rights and privileges. But once they started believing in Jesus, it was like a black mark. So they lost um, connections with their family members. They um, lost property. Uh, they did not have any more you know, favor. Then what happens is we see that they were very discouraged. And so the book of Hebrews is written to such people of great, uh, like going through great discouragement. And in that book, you know, the writer, he tells them again and again, don't let go. Like, don't um, push the limits with God. And uh, because there are dangers, like we, we can go beyond the, you know, sometimes we, we become discouraged or something happens and we are going away from God a little, but we come back. Okay, that's a normal journey of all the believers. That's okay. But what we are talking about is beyond that. When 
we let our discouragement i think discouragement is one of the major reasons why or disappointment when we think that okay this will happen in my life or that will happen and then something else happens we are not able to uh, uh we are not able to deal with it so discouragement disappointment um uh, and in that he says how to overcome see these are one of the main two reasons but other than this there can be many other reasons like not overcoming the flesh so when i'm not overcoming my flesh i'm living by the flesh not by the spirit and that will also cause me to go away from god and not experience god fully so those kind of reasons are also there ignorance ignorance is also a very big reason when you know believers don't understand so we see uh, i think it's in the book of hosea it says that um, my people perish for lack of knowledge we don't have knowledge we don't have knowledge about who we are in christ believers authority how christ has redeemed us what is our purpose then what happens the believer just lives without any meaning okay that also takes us away that relationship with god is not abundant these are all the reasons how to overcome it in the book of hebrews the writer talks about faith that's why you have hebrews chapter 11 he lists out see there are so many people they have completed the journey how they had faith in god so they had faith in god they possessed the promises they had faith in god they defeated their enemies they had faith in god you know they they brought the walls down they had faith in god so he just goes on and on faith is a big thing so for us to overcome faith is important second he says patience faith and patience because um faith, we can have faith but sometimes we 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 are like urgent god do it right now i can't wait we are in that situation both are needed if we have faith and we have patience then we can overcome so what's it about uh, uh, the first point that you think disappointment yeah. yeah so that could also be as a factor that we as a believer have wrong expectations of god or you know we have limited god to function in a way that we wanted and if it hasn't turned out in our way then we tend to be discouraged and slowly backslide possible sometimes we have wrong expectations of god sometimes we have right expectations but it doesn't happen okay or a crisis happens like you've been never prepared for some something you know like so like now i think there are people they're losing their jobs that's happening right globally people are being uh, what do you call that laid off yeah people are being laid off uh so or something some financial crisis in the family you lose a loved one sickness so when these things happen it's it's like you were expecting some you were ex- had the right expectations with god but then these are the circumstances now how do you deal with it so i think even there we have there is that whole thing of overcoming disappointment right how can we if we are very strong in god if i understand the character of god if i have a strong relationship in prayer in the word in worship like we say right the storms can come the winds can blow but the the house will still remain so yeah the question of saying like you know why me lord why did this happen to me yeah. is also kind of wrong in the sense like you know we always think only you know good should actually eventually god will work out all things for the good but yeah. when anything hits us hard the uh, instinctive should, thing like you know yeah. why me why did this happen yeah. that's kind of wrong you know as yeah see uh, is it wrong i don't know because it's human nature like if you look at some of the psalms of david he's rambling away okay he's just speaking out his thoughts not that it's theo- like theology but in the bible god has given place for man to emote express okay so i think god understands but uh, thank god we notice like how david no initially he'll say why this why are my enemies thriving all but then he'll come back and he'll say but my god will you know my he will lift me up he is great and he'll do this he'll do that so as long as we settle those rambling thoughts and, and align them to god's word we are good but if the rambling keeps going on and on and on 
even when god's word is speaking to us that has a tendency to derail us yeah okay sure yeah thank you uh, akhil those were good questions uh, let's just look at the chat here okay yes so um students here also were answering the question i asked about you know emotions all right uh, let's then go to chapter 6 so here we will study about the authority and dominion of the believer um and when we consider our authority on earth there is a basis for it so that is what we are going to look at so what is the basis for our authority on earth we are going to look at um four different reasons given here in our notes which forms the foundation of our authority we have authority that is settled okay but you could also call this as dimensions of authority basis of our authority foundation of our authority also the different dimensions of where our authority comes from so the first one is what we call as redemptive authority okay redemptive authority uh, could somebody please read revelation 12 and verse 11 Revelation chapter twelve verse eleven, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. Man, thank you for that um, scripture. So it teaches us about one of the things it states is the overcoming power of the blood of the Lamb. the blood of the lamb when we study um about this picture of the lamb in christology we may all have learned about um atonement okay so jesus came to atone for us in the old testament god had instituted certain practices of worship in which a lamb had to be sacrificed there was a need for the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of sins okay and uh, we we look at all those practices and we get an understanding of this concept of atonement that there is a need for somebody to shed the blood and in the old um, covenant usually they used to uh, i mean the old testament they used to usually have a lamb right uh, who would whose blood would be shed like a um, sinless lamb spotless blemishless lamb and that was like the ultimate sacrifice whose blood will will make atonement but we know that the blood of animals was not helpful it would it had the capacity to some extent to take away the sins or rather we we call it cover okay uh, they could only cover the sins of the people each time a person needed to go into the presence of god they would shed blood and that blood it will cover the sin then they would have the opportunity to go in go into the tabernacle go into the temple and worship god so that's how it was being practiced but when jesus came what did john the baptist say looking at jesus behold the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world so jesus became that ultimate lamb of sacrifice and the way he did the work is he he did not just cover our sins he took it away so the point is the blood of jesus is very powerful okay the work that the blood of jesus has done is um like tremendous and we need to understand the power of the blood of jesus we need to understand how the blood of jesus helps us overcome in this scripture what did we read 
we said they overcame him by the blood of the lamb how overcame by the blood of the lamb <coughs> there is a meaning in what the blood has done and yes that work the blood has already done and you see understanding what the blood has done it's very powerful if we don't understand yeah blood of jesus was shed for us okay that's it when we don't have understanding of the work of the blood even then we kind of lose out but when we are aware and we understand it becomes very very powerful so when we learn about the work of jesus on the cross <coughs> we know that we have been redeemed okay and uh, we've seen in the last class certain scriptures that tell us that jesus christ has conquered satan okay? he has conquered satan he has destroyed satan scripture passages like colossians chapter 2 verses 14 to 15 hebrews 2 verse 14 now these um passages tell us that jesus conquered satan okay and uh, he completed the redemptive work on the cross completing the redemptive work on the cross is what has given us the authority over demonic powers okay so now when we look at the when we refer to the work of the cross or the shedding of the blood okay or we refer to the power of the blood it's a reminder for satan of what jesus did on the cross okay and obviously as our enemy who is defeated satan won't like it whenever we refer to the blood of jesus what we are saying is i am redeemed jesus has done the work satan is defeated the blood is already shed the blood is powerful and i am victorious okay that is what it means when i say i stand by the blood of jesus i am redeemed by the blood of jesus and satan never likes it he doesn't like it because the blood talks about redemptive authority so the blood is upon our lives right now okay we can even look at it in this way that the blood has redeemed us and we study about how we are now part of the kingdom of light we are now part of the kingdom of christ okay so we are the redeemed of the lord jesus bought us back the blood put us into a new kingdom the blood is speaking that we no longer belong to satan and that is very frustrating for him when i say i am redeemed i'm saying satan i don't belong to your kingdom Jesus paid for me he bought me into his kingdom i now belong to jesus when i say i am redeemed it also means that every part of who i am belongs to jesus so that we can break that down further and say things like uh, you know my life belongs to jesus <coughs> excuse me my future belongs to jesus my um you know my destiny belongs to jesus my health belongs to jesus my family belongs to jesus my finances belong to jesus everything is under the blood now so if you recall just in the earlier chapter we said no legal rights so redeemed means that legally we now belong to jesus so if satan tries to intervene interfere it's illegal he cannot enter because the blood is upon our lives we belong to another kingdom all of us is in a another kingdom he can't touch us okay legally he cannot touch us so where does our authority flow from this place of redemption and we call it as the redemptive authority redemptive authority so especially when it comes to um uh, spiritual warfare speaking of the work of the blood of jesus is very powerful because every time we are saying satan you are defeated i am victorious because of what jesus did right we are saying that you have no legal rights 
only Christ has legal rights over me and everything that belongs to me. So it's warfare. Whenever we speak about what the blood has done, we are raising up, you know, you could say a war cry against Satan because we are speaking of our redemptive authority. Now, Satan may ask, how did you get that authority? Christ Jesus redeemed me. So we call it redemptive authority. Okay, have you all understood redemptive authority? Yeah, because Jesus has redeemed us, we now have authority. That's what it is. And the blood speaks about it. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next section here, which is inherited authority. Okay, I told us this is the basis for our authority. How did you get the authority? I am redeemed. So I have been given the authority. How did we get the authority? We are the children of God. So we have inherited authority. Inherited authority, we all understand. Um, we'll get into it. But there are two passages in the notes for us. Could someone please pick it up and read? Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, and then Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17. Colossians 1 30, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Oh. Romans 8 16 17, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if we children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him that we may also be glorified together. Amen. So as we can see here, we now are partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Colossians 1 verse 12. We are partakers of the inheritance of the saints. If you want to look it up in a, you know, a more convenient language for you, you can do that so that you get the understanding. That means we have a share in the inheritance that God has given the believers. Who are the saints? We are the saints. Believers are called as saints. Okay, because um, Jesus has now redeemed us and uh, you know made us holy and put us in his kingdom. So we are the saints of God. We now are partakers or we share in the inheritance of the saints. Now tell me, who uh, gets an inheritance usually? Who gets an inheritance? Sons and daughters, isn't it? From the parents, usually it's the sons and daughters. Now, it may happen that you know there are people serving in that household. They, they may have, uh, like you know, in king's palaces also you have uh, you have uh, servants, you have many, many people um, working together to, to, you know, keep that palace in order. Do you think the king will give the rights to everyone? No. Whom will he share the inheritance with? His sons, his daughters. Okay. So similarly, look at this passage. It says, the father has qualified us. To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Okay, so we could speak so much about the inheritance. What is this inheritance? Uh, what did we get from God? You know, uh, and all. But one of the one of the things that we have received as sons and daughters is authority. We have inherited authority because we are sons and daughters. In that other passage also, we have seen how the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. You know, many times when we are born again, okay, uh, yes, we may struggle to get an assurance whether we are born again or not, okay, but invariably we have a witness in our spirit that something has changed. From today, 
after i have accepted christ in my life something has changed you know i remember my own thing uh, when i used to go to church uh, like i was already born again but every time the pastor gives an altar call i'll go because i didn't know i didn't know from the scriptures that you know you are already born again like once you have made that decision but every nearly every sunday i'll be like okay god i give my life to you i don't know how many times i gave my life to christ you know but it's it's because lack of understanding of the word i didn't understand like once you have become a child of god what is this passage say the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of god somewhere inside i knew the deal is done but because of the lack of the word in my life i didn't have an understanding got it uh, but here's the reality the moment we are born again how jesus talks jesus uh, speaks to nicodemus and says how to enter the kingdom of god you must be born again you must be born again once we are born again we become children of god and the what does the holy spirit do he gives us the assurance okay anyone who's truly born again somewhere deep within we know something changed right uh, my relationship with god something has changed something has happened to me right it's very real it's very real the spiritual transformation is very real and one of the um, results uh, of being born again is that you know god now accepts us as children and look at that continue continuation children of god verse 17 and if children then heirs heirs of god and joint heirs with christ what a privilege that means that what the father gives to jesus as an inheritance we are joint heirs because who is jesus he's our brother okay the bible teaches us that he's our brother uh, and uh, so now there are many things that we must discover uh, which god has given to us as an inheritance as a child of god um and at, in this context we are emphasizing on the fact that authority has now been given to us because we are heirs we have inheritance we are joint heirs with christ so where did we get our authority we got it from uh, the fact that we are children of god okay and we can just exercise our authority just as a child of god if we if we have that settled in our understanding our approach will be very different before the lord we are able to exercise our authority so we can think of this example of you know prince and princesses so when when you see prince and princesses do they are they able to make bigger decisions uh are they able to make like um stronger choices of course because they have the uh, ability they have the resources and they also have the authority so it's very similar for us when we say we are children of god then you know there are rights there are privileges there is authority but we have to use it in the right way so we have been given authority because we are children of god or if you want to look at it the same way you know princess and prince of uh, the kingdom and we can exercise our authority against satan so when satan maybe you know again in deliverance or in spiritual warfare identity matters how strongly do i understand that i'm a child of god if i'm very strong in that i won't be afraid of any demon isn't it yes or no yeah because i know hey i am a child of god you may be a powerful demon but i carry authority you know i share in the inheritance of the saints god is my father uh, and so we can go against the enemy very powerfully so we have to settle this in our hearts one is i carry redemptive authority second is i carry uh, inherited authority as a child of god and so shall we move on okay great next would be positional authority so positional authority we've already discussed this earlier but any any case we will briefly go over it again ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 to 6 uh, could someone 
please read this. Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of this great love, which with which he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, verse 6, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. So it talks of who we are in Christ and where we are positioned in Christ spiritually. Um, we notice here that we have been made alive together with Christ and uh, God has raised us up and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when we go back to creation, did God want to give authority to man? Did God want to give dominion in his original plan? Yes. He gave man authority. Unfortunately, sin corrupted the world. Okay, uh, The response of Adam and Eve was um, that of disobedience. And so they lost their authority. Satan took that authority. But when Jesus died on the cross, that was reversed. And that is one of the reasons why Jesus came, to reverse what Satan has done. So now that what Satan did is reversed. The authority that God originally wanted man to have has now been given back to the believers. Right? Jesus has done it for all, but it is when we are in Christ that we actually receive it and we are able to walk in it. Right? We are able to walk in the overcoming power that Christ gave us. Uh, and so now that we are in Christ Jesus, we are positioned in that place of authority okay let's remember that we saw uh, ephesians 2 which tells us we are seated together with christ in the heavenly places uh, and there is one more passage actually ephesians 1 verses 20 and 21 where you know we we see that christ has positioned us far above principality and power might and dominion so God has now changed our position and we carry authority. So we can always face the devil with that assurance that Satan, I'm at a better position okay, than you because Jesus has conquered and I'm sitting with Christ and I'm exercising my positional authority on you so as we are speaking to demons or as we are taking up authority against the work of the enemy we speak of our positional authority okay positional authority is quite clear isn't it we understood it comes from who we are in christ and uh, obviously we know that we've been seated with christ in the heavenly places that is our spiritual position okay uh, and we can speak to demons we can speak to satan based on this and say, my position, I'm seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So I'm exercising my authority on you. You have no rights okay, to do what you are doing. So positional authority. And finally, over here, we have what is known as delegated authority. Okay, delegated authority, which uh, is now the fourth dimension of authority. So what are the earlier dimensions? Redemptive authority, inherited authority, positional authority, finally, delegated authority. So let's read one or two passages and then we will explain this. Uh, we could read from Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. So that is one passage. And another person, please read Mark 16, 17 and 18. Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Mark 16, 17 and 18. 18 and 19. Yes. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, great. So Jesus is um, commissioning the disciples and he says, go everywhere and make disciples in my name. Okay, baptize them in my name. All right. So let's see. Let's see Mark 16. What does it say? Mark, Mark, Mark 16, chapter Oh, sorry. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with the new tongues. Verse 18. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Amen. Okay. So, in my name, Jesus says, those who believe in me, in my name, they will do all these powerful things, supernatural things. So what is this in my name? How do, how do we understand? What is it? You know, when we say, in, uh, go bap baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In my name, you will cast out demons. What is Jesus trying to say? Why are we using the name of Jesus? If we look at Philippians chapter 2, there we learn that because Jesus humbled himself, uh, though he was God, he became man. And, you know, he, he lived that life of obedience before the Lord and he did the redeeming work. We see that he has been given the name above every other name. So which is the greatest name? The name of Jesus. Okay, the name of Jesus is the greatest name that could ever be there. And what is God telling his disciples? What is God telling his believers? In my name. So he is giving us the permission to use the greatest name of all, the name of Jesus. Now look at it like this. Just imagine we work in a, some multinational company and the CEO of the company okay, has uh, incredible um, resources. And they own whatever, billions of dollars and all that. Now, for whatever reason, they trust you. Uh, you may be one of the lower rung uh, workers, but they trust you. And maybe they are going through sickness or something like that. And then they um, authorize you to go to the bank and do the operations on their behalf. Okay, so we, we all know about power of attorney. Like a letter can be written uh, stating that so-and-so is my representative and they will come, they will do the you know operation, that they will make the deals. So don't you think it will be a privilege if that happens? And if you go to the bank, uh, will they accept us? They will because we are coming with a letter. They'll ask, in whose name are you coming? So we'll say in the name of, and maybe the name of our CEO, and then show them the letter of authorization or the power of attorney. And they'll say, oh, in the name of so-and-so, come. OK, you know, let, let's get this done. Whatever is allowed, uh, they, they will manage to you know, get, get those tasks completed. So it's just a simple example. Today, when we say, I'm going in the name of Jesus. Satan, I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. What we are saying is, the name which is so powerful, he sent me. He sent me. And so, Satan has no chance. Are you all understanding what we are trying to say? So, we are going with the authority which has been given to me. So, who I am, yes, it does matter. You know, I'm a believer and hopefully I'm walking in righteousness and all, all those other things are also there. But then... When I go in the name of Jesus, it's already speaking of authority. I'm going with great authority. And, uh, you know, we've, we've seen earlier how we have authority, exousia, and dunamis, the power of God. We go with this against the enemy. And uh, the enemy obviously has to, uh, he has to give in. Because we come from a, somebody who's so great is backing us up in the name of Jesus. No, we are going against the enemy. So it's like saying, it's also, we can look at it like this also, that when, let's say that CEO is not there, you know, and we go on their behalf, isn't it as if he, the CEO is there? Because the work still gets done. 
you've been authorized by that person and the work still gets done it's as if that person is there okay in the same way when we go in the name of jesus though jesus is in heaven right now at the right hand of the father it is like jesus is doing it when when we speak we command a demon we say i cast you out in the name of jesus i am speaking but it's as if jesus is speaking did you understand we're not trying to replace i'm not saying you know that uh, we become jesus no no all that's wrong theology that's not what we are saying we are saying that the power of delegation is is so real that though we do the work it is like jesus doing the work so satan has to listen okay so that is the understanding so when we use the name of jesus whenever we say in the name of jesus we need to understand what we are doing it's very very powerful you know the greatest name that ever exists in that name the authority of that name you know with that delegated authority i am casting out demons i am you know speaking healing over people i am uh, doing the works that god has called me to do so it's it's delegated authority that we are exercising when we use the name of jesus and we are functioning as representatives of christ so on the basis of these four uh, dimensions or four foundations of authority we can conquer in life whether it is sin whether it is sickness whether they are demons whether it is some sort of a circumstance situation whatever it is we can conquer we can exercise our authority and we can overcome okay and a believer needs to uh, have the understanding have the understanding is one second is exercise exercise so that's uh, what this chapter is all about if there are any questions we can talk about it uh, otherwise we can move on to the next chapter oh okay um yes shani i see your hand raised yeah i just have i think maybe i'll um, shani maybe please just... a moment can't hear you we'll fix this Uh, sister i would like to ask this question we have we go in the name okay, of jesus which is the name of well. please hold on please hold on All right, uh, let's do this because uh, we're almost at the end. Maybe we can take a break and then we can begin with uh, Shani and Kofi's questions. So let's go ahead with a break and then we'll come back. Uh, I hope that's fine. Okay, excellent. Thank okay. you. Thank you, everyone. God bless. Okay.